All right, if you will, open up your Bibles back up to 2 Samuel. Um, 2 Samuel. We kind of left off on part number one of questions and answers. But now we're going to continue with part number two. Uh, we have about, I have about six or seven more questions. And if the Lord will, if it goes to part three, then so be it. But um, the fourth question that we left off, left off at is, who makes a person sick? Once again, a lot of y'all not going to agree with what I say according to the scripture, according to definition. Uh, you're not going to believe me. And a lot of you are not going to believe me because of tradition. And many of you may be elect that's going to fight this right now. But if you're elect of God, chosen and ordained to eternal salvation in Jesus Christ, then one day you will come to, to the understanding of some of this that I'm teaching. You might not come to the understanding of all of it, but you will under, come to the understanding of some of it. But some of you won't believe it because you can't. God has not granted you that favor to believe because you're not of a sheep, as he already said unto us back in John 10. Now, open up your Bible Second Samuel, but uh, put a piece of paper right there because I want to go back to Romans the 11th chapter. Because one of the questions that I asked, and I left off this scripture, and it's a very important scripture, that declares who is the individual that does the blinding of men that they can't be saved, that they can't see spiritually, and perceive spiritually, and hear spiritually. They cannot do it because this individual who blinded them is the one that blinds all men that he does not want to be in his family. Bottom line. Go back to Romans the 11th chapter. Romans the 11th chapter, quickly. Romans the 11th chapter. If you have a Bible, please turn with me. We in part two are questions and answers. The type of questions and answers that some people do deal with. I'm not the only one. There are some people around the globe that deal with these hard hidden questions. But a lot of, there's, there's a lot of pastors, a lot of leaders and teachers and quote Christianum or uh, uh, quote those who deal with spiritual matters that won't deal with these questions for the simple fact they'll lose money, they'll lose people, they'll lose fame, they'll lose status in this wicked, corrupt world you live in and they're working worry about that stuff. They worry about continuing to have that status in life among wicked and ungodly mankind. But I don't, and I don't care. Go to Romans, the 11th chapter. Who is the one that blinds men? And if you will, go back to part one. I went in a, a, a decent amount of detail about who's the one that does the blinding. Romans, the 11th chapter. Let's get one more witness about the individual that does the blinding. Romans the 11th chapter. This is Paul. He's writing to the uh, believers at Rome. Uh, we'll start at verse 1. I say then, have God cast away his people, talking about literal Israel, God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abram, of the tribe of Benjamin. God have not cast away his people, which he foreknew or knew intimately. Won't, won't means no. Know ye not that the scripture said to Elijah, how he make an intercession to God against Israel? Saying, Lord, this is what Elijah said, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars. And I am left alone and they seek my life. But what said the answer of God unto him, unto Elijah, when he said that to God? God said to Elijah, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to the image of Baal. And Baal was an ancient sun god that was worshipped by Israel had got involved in worshipping Baal, the sun god. Uh, but also the surrounding nation was worshipping the sun gods and all kinds of gods, tree gods, uh, moon gods. Um, many different kinds of types of gods was the surrounding pagan nation worshipping. But he's speaking of Israel. He's interceding against Israel. Elijah did. Verse 4 again. But what says, what says the ounce of God unto him? I have res reserved to myself 7,000, but what says God, what says the ounce of God unto him, sorry? I have received to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, Paul is saying now, to the Roman believers, even so then, at this present time. Also there is a remnant. Remnant means a few. Also there is a few according to election of grace. God is elected by his grace, a family. Even at this present time, there is also a remnant or a few according to the election of grace. 
And if it, if it by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be by working or works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more works. In other words, if this thing is going to be by works, then it's not grace. If it's going to be by grace, then it's not works. It's either by works or grace. And Paul has said it simply is by the election of grace. God has a remnant of few, even at this present time, of what he was speaking in and the day he was living in. Even at this present time, God still has only a few that he has elected by grace. Look at verse 7. What then? Paul, look what Paul said. Israel, he's speaking of literal Israel. Yes, he was a Benjamin, a bit uh, uh, tri of the tribe of Benjamin. Yes, he was a literal Israelite. But look what he said of Israel, the literal Israel. What then? Israel have not obtained that which is seeking for. But who have? But the election or the elected have obtained that grace. And the rest were Ding, 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 ding. Blinded. The rest were blinded. So, it is, even though little Israel was a chosen race of God, you can read that in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, or 1 through 10, and you can see that God said, I chose you, Israel, out from among all the other nations on the face of the earth, not because you were the greatest in number, as a matter of fact, Israel, you were the fewest in number, but I set my love upon you and chose you. What was God? What's wrong with God? Well, why is he choosing just a one nation? Why didn't he choose every nation? Because God has never desired to choose everybody to belong to him. Bottom line. But once again, it said the election or the elected have obtained it, and the rest were binded. Even amongst literal Israel. God only elected certain to be, uh, have the faith in him to walk by him in obedience and belong to him. Not every Israelite was chosen to be in the family of God. As a race, he picked them out to share his law with, but not everybody in that race of Israel were elected to be a part of his spiritual family amongst the literal Israel. And it's the same today. Even amongst the literal Gentiles, even amongst the literal Jews still living. Everyone that's on the face of the earth has not been elected by grace to be a part of God's family. Bottom line. He says, so the elected have obtained it, and the rest were ding, 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 blinded. Now, that word blinded there, it means to be hardened. When God hardens a man's heart like he did Pharaoh, that means God's, God blinds a man, spiritually speaking. Look at verse 8. It's going to tell you who blinded the people. Romans chapter 11, verse 8. According to as it is written, God had given them the spirit of slumber. Who did? The spirit of slumber. Eyes that they cannot see and ears that they cannot hear. That they should not hear unto this day. God is the one that gives a man Eyes that they cannot hear, eyes that they cannot see, ears that they cannot hear, even unto this very day. God gives men a spirit of stupor. Stupor means, also means to be stupid. God puts the st stupidity and, and in a man's mind or in a woman's mind where they cannot understand the gospel. The ones that he wants to understand the gospel, he will give them a spirit of understanding and eyes that they can see and ears that they can hear that they may, should be healed, and they be saved. Jehovah God, Yah, Yahshua, Yahweh, Wahweh. Or some of them say, because they don't like to pronounce it under his name, they say it takes away from uh, his majesty. When you say it, some say him. Well, let me say him. Let me say the unknown, unknown God then. That's the one that blinds men so that they cannot receive the light of the gospel of Christ. Now, back to, turn your Bible to 2 Samuel. We're back to the question to finish up the question. We left off at Micah chapter 6 verse 13.
How Michael the prophet was speaking against Israel had, uh, because God was contentious towards Israel. Michael the prophet spoke against them and said, the Lord is going to make, make thee sick, Israel. The Lord is going to make thee sick and smiting thee because of thy sins, Israel. So the Lord smote Israel with ding, 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 sickness. Let's, let's go back to Samuel, 2 Samuel. Now once again, in 2 Samuel, uh, we're going to start around the 13th verse. You know, once again, this is a story about David, how he um, beheld Bathsheba bathing, and he, he did something that was common to the flesh, once again, lusted after her, and, 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 and began to long for her, and he sent for her, he laid with her, she became pregnant. Uh, for them to try to cover it up, he asked Uriah, which was... Bathsheba's husband to come and to come in. He talked with him and he asked her to go lay with her. But Uriah did not do so. He was a very devout to his brethren. He did not lay with her, go in his house and lay down and relax and be in comfort with his wife while his brother was at war. He didn't want to do it. So David had a plan B. What he did is he told his, uh, his commander and chief of army, uh, Joab, to go and put uh, Uriah the Hittite in the heat of the battle, in the front of the battle, that he may be slain by the enemy. And that is exactly what happened. He was killed in the heat of battle. So the, uh, Bathsheba was pregnant, but God said something about this baby. Uh, you in 2 Samuel. Uh, 2 Samuel, look at the tw uh, 12, we are 12. Starting in verse 13. Now this is after Nathan the prophet had rebuked David. David understood that God had made his sin, made known that his sin was made manifest and his sin was open. Verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against thee, Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord has also put away thy sin. You should not die. According to the law, he was supposed to die because you take another man's wife, a capital offense was a, a daughter was a capital offense. He was supposed to die, be stoned to death. But he, God had mercy on this man, David, that was after his own heart. But yet David went after this lady and took her. And he said, he told David, thou shalt not die. Look at verse 14. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee, talking about through Bathsheba, shall surely die. Now, one of the reasons why we should stay away, our, away from our sin, private sin too, but especially open sin, because it gives the enemies of God, the enemies of the cross of Christ, much room to blaspheme against God. And God gets angry about those who blasphemes his name, makes a mockery out of his authority, which is his character, which is his word. And he said, verse 15, And Nathan departed unto his house. Nathan left. And the Lord, hold it, who is this? And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David. And it was very, ding, 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 sick. Very sick. The Lord struck the child. The Lord struck the child. Not Satan. The Lord struck the child. Now, I want to do something here. Um, the struck is the, uh, that word struck is the number 50, uh, 62 in your Hebrew Aramaic Dictionary. Look it up in your Strong's. Uh, it is the word Nagoff. Nagoff. Nagoff means to push, to defeat. To inflict with disease. And to plague, all 
also to smite. The Lord is the one that struck the innocent child. Yes, this is the God of the Bible. Struck the innocent child or the uh, defeated the innocent child or inflicted the innocent child with disease or plagued the innocent child or smote the innocent child. The Lord is the one that struck it. Who? No, no, I didn't say the baby deserved it. No, I didn't rejoice and clap in my hands because the baby got sick. I am saying simply that the Lord is the one that struck the child. This is Bible to the core. This is what you call exegesis. You read the scripture line upon line, precept upon precept, chapter by chapter. You don't isolate the scripture, which means you think of something or you, you, get, you conjure up a thought in your head and you try to go to the scripture to prove your thought that you'll conjure up. You don't do that. You go to the scripture... See what the scripture said and let the mind of Christ or the mind of God which is in the scripture become your mind. You don't put your mind in the scripture and try to make what you thought, what you think, your perceptions, your thoughts, your imaginations to become reality and place it as law. This is where heresies begin. This is where defection from the truth begin. This is how many people defect from Christ. Uh, uh, defect from Christ. Amen. Okay, the Lord struck the child. So, the Lord struck the child, and the child became sick. The child became sick. Look here in verse 16. Let's keep reading. David therefore besought, the, besought God for the child, and David fasted. And it went in, and went in, and lay all night upon the earth. So David had fasted. He had laid, out, laid, all, laid down all night on the ground. Look at verse 17. And the elders of his house arose and went to him. To raise him up from the earth or from the ground. But he would not. Neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass. On the seventh day. That the child died. Who was the one that struck the child and it became very sick? The Lord. The Lord is the one that killed the innocent child. And no babies don't go to hell. That's a lie. And demons ain't entering into no babies, you woman Catholics. Babies don't go to hell. As a matter of fact, this text is going to prove it out in a minute. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How would he then vex? He would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that the servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself. And changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came into his own house, and he, when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. So they was eating now. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. Verse 22. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? Notice this. Notice this clearly. That David prayed and fasted and wept and laid upon the earth while the child was still alive, but it was very sick before the child died. Notice that it's weeping and it's laying on the earth. It's not eating, which is his, which was his fasting for food. Notice it. It didn't. His praying. None of that changed thing. Change anything about the child. Prayer, fasting, none of that changes the ordained, already arranged will of God in every individual's life upon the earth. Your prayer, your fasting, it does not change the will of God at all. People say, "Well, I prayed. My mother got healed." Well, I prayed and uh, I seen uh, a person get up out of the wheelchair. Let me tell you something. Being here and all them fools are lying, first of all. Second of all, 
Just because something happened after you prayed doesn't mean your prayer changed it. Prayer changes things. Uh, just a, it's it's about uh, uh, it's not as a very foolish doctrine, but it's not that old at all. That thing is really only about a hundred. That false doctrine really only about a hundred and fifty ish, uh, maybe about a hundred years old. That's really a false, false doctrine. That's not that old, old at all. But anyhow, his praying, his fasting, his laying up on the earth did not change the child from dying. The child still died because the Lord ordained that the child die. The Lord is the one that struck the child. And so David said, who knows? And look here in verse 22. And he, and he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and I wept, I cried. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious? Now you may pray and say, Lord, if it be thy will for my child to live in the situation my grandmother to live, if God be gracious, then he may let him live. But God still is gracious when he take that believer or take that parent or take that child. If they're not, even if, they're, even if that young child, um, that grandma, that uncle is not a believer, God is still gracious when he take a life and when he preserve, preserves a life. So the Lord is the one that makes a person sick. He's the one that calls sickness to come upon a person. It doesn't matter if they have been guilty of something or not. God can lay a sickness upon an individual and take them out of this earth, even if they've been in a great deal of pattern, a great pattern of obedience towards the Lord. God lay a sickness to take that person out. God is holy. Man is unholy. Now, so the Lord is the one that makes one sick. You remember back in Micah, the sixth, uh, sixth chapter, uh, 13, when he said, I will make thee sick, Israel, and smiting thee because of the sin? Let me go back and give you a word, by right quick. Smiting. Smiting. Um, that word smiting in Micah, 6, 13, is number 520, 52, 21 in your Hebrew Aramaic Dictionary. Look it up in your Strong's. It is the word, no call. No call. It means to slay. Oh boy. To kill. It means to slaughter. In a literal or a figurative sense. God will slaughter a person spiritually and, 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 and make them and make them to be like they're dead spiritually when they begin to go out the self. But in a physical manner, God is the one that slays. God is the one that kill, uh, kills a person. God is the one that slaughters a person. Not Satan. we get to that. That's another part of another question in a minute. But smiting. God said, I'm the one that's going to slay you and kill you and slaughter you with sickness, Israel. Over there in Micah 16, 6.13. Stay with me. If you have a Bible, stay with me. If you hate definition, click me off. I have no problem with you. You're not going to upset me. Bottom line. Now, we're on question number five now. Question number one was, uh, who makes one poor? It was the Lord. Question number two was, who blinds a person from seeing truth? The answer was the Lord. The question number three was, who controls the storms, the hurricanes, uh, the strong winds, the tempests, the great rains, the small rains, and the storms. The answer was the Lord. Question number four was, who makes a person sick? The answer was, and still is, the Lord. We own question number five. Number five. What is this question number five? Who kills a human being? Some of you say, man do, or guns do, or the devil do. Who kills a human being? I give you five seconds to think about that. Theologian, got your answer yet? Go ahead and get your answer together. Theologians. Amen. Who kills a human being? Well, first of all, let's go back to 1 Samuel. 
First Samuel 2. This is back to the prayer of Hannah. Start this off. This question was starting this off going by going back to the uh, prayer of the righteous lady that God made righteous Hannah. We start at verse 5 and read from there. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren have borne seven, and she that have many children is wax feeble. Look at verse 6. Are you with me? The Lord killeth. The question is, who killed the human being? The Lord killeth. God puts breath in the body. God brings the individual into this world. He is the one that takes the individual out of this world. No matter if it's through a bullet, a car wreck, a train wreck, a boat wreck, a murder, I don't care, uh, a disease, cancer, diabetes, a, a mistake in a surgery, a, 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 a slip and hit their head. It doesn't matter. It don't matter how it go, an innocent child through a bullet, a, a child getting ran over. I know those are hard things, and I know those are calamities, and I know it's not going to feel good to me if they happen to me or to you. But let me tell you, it's the Lord that arranged and ordained and took the life out of that body by that manner and through that avenue. The Lord killeth. It. It's amazing that uh, I watch it on uh, 60 Minutes. Um... Whitney Houston's mother, they asked her was she angry with God, and she looked up at the camera in such a manner like this, and yes, uh, Whitney Houston was very corrupt, she lived an ungodly life, bottom line, that's no secret, but her mother looked up to the camera, and they asked her was she angry with God, and she looked up at the camera, and she said, no, oh, I'm not angry with God, why should I be angry with God, who knows all, and does all, oh, she spoke Bible. She spoke Bible. God is the one that yes knows all and does all. Even the taking of life. I don't care that yes, even when it seems brutal, it's the one that is the Lord the one that takes the life. Let's get over here. Let's read verse six again. First Samuel chapter two, verse six. The Lord killeth and maketh the life. He bringeth down to the grave. He's the one that brings the individual down to be in that grave where he's laid in that grave or he or she, young or old, it does not matter, laid in that grave. He brings it down to the grave and the Lord brings it up. So it's the Lord that killeth. Uh, if you will, uh, let me, let me uh, give you this word uh, kill. When it says the Lord killeth, let me get this word kill. It's number 4191. 4191. It is the word moof. It is the word moof. And this word moof means to die. In a literal or figured, figurative sense, it means to destroy. It means to slay. To lose one's life and it also means to lose one's life in a physical sense, either man or beast. So even when a beast is killed, the Lord that took that beast's life, it don't matter if it was a lion taking a, a life of a lamb or a lion taking the life of a deer, it has to say it comes from the same word move. And so, when it says the Lord killeth, 1 Samuel 2, 6, it's the Lord that causes a person to die, it's the Lord that destroys a person, it's the Lord that slays a person, and it's the, war, it's the Lord, Jehovah, Yah, Yahshua, Yahweh, Yahweh, it doesn't matter what you call him, it is the Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, that causes a man or woman to lose one's life, or lose their life. The Lord killeth. Definition is everything. Especially living in this Babylonian nation over here of America. Now, uh, if you will, go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Deuteronomy 32, 39. The Lord is 
doesn't want to kill her. And when I asked that question about who makes one sick, I did not even go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28, when he was talking about if you don't obey, obey my laws, is going to have you. See, a lot of you just said, uh, um, would say, according to Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, that's why the Lord made them sick because they didn't obey. Listen, like, like I said, God will punish a person with sickness or different things because they do not obey. Uh, but there are people out here who are obeying God. And they say they're perfect without sin, but they have a pattern of obedience, and God will still make sickness come upon them. So bottom line, no matter how you try to fix it up, it's the Lord that makes an individual sick. And it's the Lord that killeth, and that's what we have right now. Who kills a human being? Deuteronomy chapter 32. Look at verse 39. Moses the prophet speaking on the behalf of the God of Israel, and he said, See now that I, God is speaking through Moses, even I am he, and there is no God with me. Now, in this context, he's talking about idol gods. He said, there is no God with me. I kill. I move. I destroy. I cause I call a person to die. I cause a, a person to lose their life. I slay a person. I kill. And I make alive sovereignty. I kill and I make alive. I wound. And I heal. He don't wound by your prayer. He don't heal by your prayer. God wound and heal because he desires to. It's by his ordained desire, his ordained decree, his pleasure, his choice. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. That's amazing. Look at this word wound. This word wound here. Wound. He said, I wound. That word wound here is number 42, 72 in your Hebrew, Aramaic dictionary. Look it up in your strong. Makat. 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 And it means to dash asunder. It means to crush. To smash violently. God is the one that wounds a person. Dashes, dashes a person asunder. Crushes a person and smashes them violently. You remember when the Babylonians came and, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, the Romans came in and um, overthrew Jerusalem in 70 A.D.? You remember that? And Rachel was weeping for her children. Those Romans were the hand of God to do the killing that God won't done upon disobedient Israel for all of their traditions and all of their twisting and perversion of scripture and all of their idolatry and their rebellion. God sent an evil nation to destroy them and they were the hand and the anger of God to come down upon Israel. We're going to see some things soon. More. About, about how evil and wicked men are nothing but the hand of God. Is it, and we're almost there. Look here. So God said, I wound, I kill, and I make a lie. I wound and I heal. As a matter of fact, um, go to Revelation 1, 18. Revelation 1, 18. Revelation 1, 18. Who's in authority of death? God kill him. God make a lie. Look at uh, Revelation 1.18. I started verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am him that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive evermore. Amen. And have the keys or the authority of hell, which means the grave, and death. The word hell is the word Hades. And Hades simply means the death of the grave. Or the place of the unseen. 
So God said, I hold the keys. I have the authority of the, to the place of the unseen, which is the grave, and death. God controls who dies. God's the one that sends death to the individuals that are going to die in the next 60 seconds. No matter what way, no, and no matter what manner it is, God is the one that sends it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's not easy preaching this God right here because a lot of people reject it. It's not always easy for me to preach this God, but this is the God of the Bible, and I must obey God rather than man. God is the one that kills. God is the one that controls death. God is the one that wounds and slays and chops a man into pieces and dashes a man asunder. God is the one. That's not all. Go to uh, Job, the 13th chapter. Job. Job, the 13th chapter. Watch this. Proving you God got sovereign control over life and death. And he's the one that brings life in. He's the one that kills and takes life out of an individual. Now, you remember Job? Job was going through affliction. Uh, his children had been killed. House, cattle had been destroyed. And there's many other things that happened to Job. Uh, uh, he had boils from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. And he was in great agony. And uh, look what Job said in Job, 13 to 15, Job chapter 13 to 15 verse. He said, speaking of God, um, he said in the hearing of, of some of his friends, he said, Though he, speaking of God, slay me, yet will I, I trust him. But I will maintain my own ways before him. And when Job was saying, I maintain my way before him, he was trying to say, I'm going to defend myself before God. He said, though he, speaking of God, slay me. What Job was saying, that God is sitting, though God is sitting here slaying me, Killing me off. Taking, making my body weaker and weaker. I'm still going to trust him as God. But yet, I'm going to try to defend myself before... Joe, Joe, why would you try to defend yourself? None of us can defend ourselves before God. No matter how much righteousness we do. No matter how much how many right things or good things we do. You still can defend yourself before God when he brings up affliction upon you. Because when you, you're, you're not without sin. You're not without walking, in in, walking without any imperfection. So whenever you try to defend yourself before God, you're automatically going to be guilty. You can never say, God, but I've been doing this and I've been doing that, I've been doing that. And what you're saying to God is that, God, I've been doing all these right things in your sight. And God is saying, so I'm the Paul and you're the clay. And I do what I will with you. You're in my hands. I control you. So if I'm slaying you or putting an affliction upon your body, it's good that you still trust me. Don't try to defend yourself. And Job was trying to defend himself. When he said, I've maintained my way before the Lord. Look at that word maintain. Now, uh, that's not it. Who kills? Look at Job 9.22. Flip over. 9.22. Look at this. God destroyed the man. <laughs> Job said in Job 9.22, This is one thing, therefore, I said. He, speaking of God, destroyed the perfect and the wicked. See, even though you're walking upright, a person who walks mature, God can kill that person, and you be like, why? Why did he take him? Why did he take her? Why did he take his baby? Why did he take... It doesn't matter. God seems fit. He controls death. He controls life. He kills. He makes a lie. He brings down to the grave. He brings up. God is sovereign. He takes the life of whomever he will, and whatever man he will, and it glorifies him. We are to bow, not laugh at the person, say, ah, ha, that's what happened to you, or, or try to act all happy that the person died, and be all in the picture person faith acting a fool say it's God that did it we just gotta bow to his will I remember back in the news about a few years back and I watched the news and uh, a lady uh, two uh, young uh, family guy family members got to fight and they accidentally shot the the female family one of the young female family members to try to break it up and they and she died and the family was weeping. They went through a lot of bickering. Um, and so after a little while, 
went by. Uh, they had one of the aunts, I believe, up on the news, just as a uh, going back and check up on the family to see about the case. And she said, she said these words. She said, uh, the Lord does all things for a reason. Yes, even though people are dying by the, through the physical, through guns and through the physical hands of men and different ways, it's still the working of God. The only the instruments of God only. When Israel, God used the people of Israel as a as a as a a, a tool in His hand to punish the other nations when they came against Israel. God would uh, cause Israel to go into battle, and that little group of Israelites would whoop uh, uh, armies that was two and three times their size, two and three times their size, and. God was, God was using Israel as his hand to destroy the nations. But then when Israel would get involved in their idolatry, God would use even nations as his hand to come and whoop Israel and destroy and, and brutally uh, chastise Israel. God is sovereign, folk. This is the God of the Bible. Did I have another one? Yes, look at Psalm 17. Quickly. Psalm 17. Psalm 17. Tell you God is sovereign. Psalm 17 verse 3. Uh, as a matter of fact. One final paper here. Okay good. I got it right here. Good news. Good news. Psalm 17 verse 13. Look what it says. Arise O Lord and disappoint him. Cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. The word which is is not in the original text. It's not in the original Greek manuscript, that word which is. So what it really reads, how it really reads in the Greek, arise the Lord and disappoint him. Cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked, thy sword. The wicked is the sword of God, is the hand of God to do things that he wants done up on the earth. Just like also the wicked being his creation, being, being the sword to do, do things of, that he wants done up on the earth, so is also the righteous, still the hand of God to do the righteousness he wants up on the earth. God is sovereignty. He is sovereign. It'd be good if you can read that, Arthur Pink, Sovereignty of God. Now, look at verse 14. From men... Let me read verse 13 again. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him. Cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. From men, which are thy hand. And it really reads, from men, thy hand. Men are the hand of God. Men upon the earth are the hand of God to do exactly what God created, it, created them and ordained them to do. Or appointed or assigned them to do. Nothing that you see upon the face of this earth is happening outside of the will of God. There's no such thing as no permissive will and divine will. God got only one will. He has the, and it's his decree, ordained will. There is no permissive will. But, and they get that mess from Israel. Uh, they, some of them get that doctrine from Israel as they kept on asking God. God never, God didn't want them to have a king, so they kept on begging Samuel. We want a man king like the other nations. We want a man king like the other nations. And God said, "Okay, they're not, they're, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. I'll give them a man king, and he ain't gonna do nothing but put a burden upon them and be hard upon them and take portions of their belongings and things of this nature." Listen, God already ordained that Saul come onto the scene before the foundations of the world. It wasn't because they was asking for a man king that God put his divine will to the side and uh, brought a permissive will in and permitted it to happen. God didn't God didn't permit it to happen. He ordained for Saul to be the king of Israel. God ordained that pathway for Israel. To teach them that lesson. With a permissive will. Now. It says in uh, 14. Uh, Psalm 17 verse 14. From men which are thy hand. O Lord. From men of the world. Which have their portion. 
in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with the hid, thy hid treasure, they are full of children, and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. All right. Now, so God is sovereign. God is the one to kill. Well, you say, no, Satan is the one to kill. You say, I can prove it. Well, how can you prove it? Where are you going to go? Well, I can go to John 10, verse number 10. Because the enemy come to kill, steal, and destroy. The enemy come to kill, steal, and destroy. Well, you're wrong. Look at John 10. Turn about to John 10. And we'll start at verse number 1. Now you have to stick with context of Scripture. Proper exegesis of the Scripture. Jesus said in verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entered not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. The same as a thief and a robber. Ding, ding, ding. The same as a thief and a robber. Ding, ding, ding. The same as a thief and a robber. Remember these words. Remember these words. We're still talking about who kills a human being. The same as a thief and a robber. Remember these words. Look at verse 2. But he that entered in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Verse 4. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow. I'm going to put this stranger up here too. And a stranger they will not follow, but they but will flee from him. For they know not the voice of strangers. Verse 6. This parable spoke Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which spoke unto them. Verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Verse 8. All that ever came before me are Ding, ding, ding. Thieves and robbers. You catching the drift yet? All that ever came before me were thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter, he shall be saved. And shall go in and out and find pastor. Look at verse 10. The ding, 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 thief. The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and to destroy. I am come that they may, might have life and that they, 
talking about the sheep, the ones he's just talking about that follow his voice. They might have life and have it more abundantly. So when it says the thief coming to kill, steal, and destroy, that's not talking about Satan. It's talking about those that Jesus said came before him or who were only thieves and robbers because they didn't come through him. He was talking about the false teachers of his day. They the ones that steal, kill, and destroy the people. What is killing, stealing, and destroying the people of his day? By their false twisting and preaching the commandments of men and the traditions of men rather than the commandments of God. The commandments of men only turn you further away from the truth. According to Titus 1 verse 14. Fables of men, traditions of men turn you away from the truth. So the thief that come to kill, steal, and destroy are the thieves, the robbers, the strangers, the false teachers. To even today, they are the thieves and the robbers and the strangers that are killing and stealing and destroying the people spiritually all around the world. John 10.10 10 is not talking about the enemy, Satan, or the thief being Satan. So when you talk about who's the one that kill it, it's the Lord that kill it. God that takes life and gives life. That's question number five. Question number six. Who made mankind depraved? Who made mankind depraved? Who made mankind depraved? I'm going to give you a few seconds after that. Some of y'all saying that Adam did it all. Are some of y'all saying that that a man does it on his own? What are you saying? Well, let's find out who does it. If you will, turn to John, the first chapter. Look at verse number one, two, three. John, St. John, chapter one, start at verse one. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things. Sometimes when you see the word all, it's meaning every single thing. Sometimes when you see the word all, it's meaning the all. Meaning the complete of something. And you have to pay attention to the context. So I love learning things about the Greek con the Greek language and a uh, Greek Eastern way of thinking. All right. Look at here. It says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. How do I know about this all meaning everything in this context? It's because the whole, the whole verse number three bears it out. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That was made. Now, I don't care what it is, everything in this life, everything in this world exists of the power of God. Everything, including Satan, including evil, including all the things that we say is negative in this life. It only created by the great director and a great producer, God. He brought it all into existence. I believe that we're going to do a part three of this because there's a lot more that I have left. So if you will, come back for the next segment.